Now, I've been doing a series the last, well, we've gone the last 13 weeks, we're doing a series on the book of Acts. So we've done uh, a journey through the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, all the way to, I think, last week was Acts chapter 12, where we prayed, we, we taught about the praying church. And uh, so obviously, we, we're going to continue with that series. But today, given that, that this wonderful opportunity that we had to pray for my in-laws on this marriage celebration. I want to talk about legacy, and then next Sunday we'll continue with the book of Acts chapter 13. So I want to talk about legacy, just thinking about what we just did now, and what does legacy look like? What is legacy according to God's Word? And uh, I think that we're going to be blessed by that Word this morning. So open your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. God calls us to leave a legacy, to leave a godly legacy to those that follow us. But what is legacy? Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in you also. So did you see the transfer of faith from the grandmother to the mother and to the son? There was this transfer of faith that was visible, that was evident, and that the Apostle Paul says, it reminds me, the faith that you have reminds me of your of the faith that your mother had. And that faith that your mother had was passed down to her by her grandmother. That was a a legacy of faith. It was a spiritual legacy. I remember, he says, the unfeigned faith. That word unfeigned means sincere, genuine, without pretense. This, This was not a pretend faith. The faith that you have, Timothy, It's a genuine, sincere, it is not a faith that is counterfeit. It is a true faith. It's got substance. There's foundation to your faith. Amen. There is a a word to your faith. It it didn't just come overnight. It was was birthed in you. Amen. It says there, this unfeigned, true, sincere, without hypocrisy faith, Notice what it says, that is in you, okay? I want you to hear that. The faith, the, the spiritual legacy that Paul witnessed in Timothy, amen, was deposited in him. And then he says, which dwelt first in your grandmother and then in your mother, and I am persuaded that now dwells in you. Amen. Can you say amen, church? Wow. So there's this, this faith, this legacy that was spiritual, passed down from generation to generation, was deposited in. So legacy is a word that many get wrong and they confuse. And therefore there is much unbalance to legacy. I think these, this verse that we read speaks to true legacy. It is what is deposited in someone. Amen. It is what they become. Because many today, unfortunately, think that legacy is material. So they think legacy is a material thing. So I've got to leave material blessings for my children in order to leave a legacy. And that's not legacy. We'll look at that later on. That's inheritance. It's a form of legacy, but it's not... It's not the core of true, spiritual, godly legacy. Because you can have someone that, that was left a massive in, material inheritance, but have been left a bad legacy. Yeah. Nothing was deposited in them. They were only given things out here. So, so legacy is not buildings. Legacy is not companies. Legacy is not wealth. Legacy is not investments. Legacy is not the church. The church is not legacy. Houses are not legacy. 
things are not legacy. And unfortunately, the majority of our time is spent trying to chase these things to leave them to the next generation. And as we do that, we neglect the main thing. So we said, like, I'm working for my children. I'm trying to leave them a great legacy. And really what they want is they want you. They want me. So many excuse uh, this chasing after the things, chasing after wealth. They excuse it by saying, I'm doing this for my children. I'm doing this to leave a legacy. But not realizing that that the, our children, what they want is they want us. Amen. So we need to find a balance, yeah. brothers and sisters, a healthy balance that prioritizes our children more than anything or anyone else in the world. We've got, as parents, one job, and that is to bring up men and women of God Amen. that will live, live out spiritually what has been deposited into them. Amen? We need to realize that everything else pales into insignificance when it comes to raising up godly children who know how to live by faith. What a testament of the grandmother and the mother through the life of Timothy. I've got, a, I've got an image of your mother in you. I've got an image of your grandmother in you, not because of what you're driving, not because of the house you're living in, not because of the clothes you're wearing, but the image that reminds me of your mother and your grandmother is this faith that is in you. Hallelujah. Mm. So they obviously invested a lot of time to deposit this into them. Can you shout amen, church? Amen. Amen. Now, go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Because I love how the Apostle Paul puts it. I love what the Apostle Paul says. Are you ready for this? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Second Corinthians 3, 1 and 2. Now look how the Apostle Paul puts his legacy. He says, everyone has it? Or you can look up at the screen, there it is. He says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Question. Now, the word commend means, do I begin to exhibit myself? Do I want to prove myself to you? Am I, am I, do, I, do I want to praise myself? Do I begin to mention my name wherever I go? Am I trying, do I need to show off? The Apostle Paul is saying that. He's saying, do I, do, do I need to commend myself? Do I need to praise myself? Do I need to talk about myself? Do I need to talk about everything that I've done? That's a question mark. And then he says, or, or need we as others epistles of, commenda of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Then he says, so, or do we need like others are doing going around that they need letters of commendation they need letters that he prays on them and they need letters that talk highly about them, which will give them access, which will show everyone, this is what I've done, this is what I'm doing. Look at my life, look at my ministry, look at my, my, my business. What, do, 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 do I need, like so many others are doing, letters that prove my ministry or that prove who I am? It's a question mark. The answer is no. The answer is no. He goes, I don't, I don't need to prove myself to anyone. I don't need letters of praise that he prays on me about what I've done and how I act and how I conduct myself, my integrity, my love for God, my devotion as a father, as a husband. I don't, I don't need letters, you know, let me, let me just put it plainly. I don't need, I don't need some post on Facebook. Yeah, that's right. yes. You don't need some post on Facebook to tell the world how lovely you are and how great you are. Look what he says. He says, you are our epistles, written in our hearts, knowing, I love this, and read by all men. Wow. 
You are our letters. Who? The one he's been investing his life in. The one he's been depositing spiritual truths into. He says, I don't, I don't need letters. I don't need a post. I don't need a recommendation. I don't need you to heap praise on me. I don't need to talk about myself because the evidence is there. You are my letters. So we look at this now as a father and as a mother. Our children are our letters. So you say, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll never write a book in my life. You're writing every day. Your children are the letters that will be written that others will read and say, ah, oh, you're like your dad. Or you got that from your mom. Amen. You know, this is powerful, church. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. Just skip over two, two chapters. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. He's talking about the same thing. For we commend not ourselves again to you. The Apostle Paul, he's, he's not trying to prove himself. And I, I sometimes think the more that we try to prove ourselves, the more we're trying to hide. See, when you, when you have lost all desire... To prove yourself, you're free. You're free. If you're comfortable in the letters you're writing, if you're comfortable in the investments you're making, and you're comfortable in your teaching, amen, if you're comfortable in that, then there's no need for commendation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13, For we commend not ourselves again to you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf. In other words, you talk about me. Let your children testify of the kind of father and the kind of mother that you were. That, that, that cannot be faked. That, com- that, that cannot be manufactured. Yeah. Amen. But, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that you may have somewhat to answer them I love this, which glory in appearance and not in heart. So there's people going around, the Apostle Paul says, that are glorying in appearance but not in heart. Their appearance looks like they've got it all together, but in heart there's something missing. See, material possession speaks nothing to the condition of the heart or to one's integrity. Material possession speaks nothing to the condition of the heart or to one's integrity, but it does speak to the fact that one has money. (laughs) That's all it speaks to. Material possessions does not speak to the fact that one has integrity and that that one can reveal the condition of their heart. All it reveals is that one has financial weight or financial blessing. But it does not necessarily reveal morals. It does not necessarily reveal a healthy marriage. And it does not reveal a strong family. Can I say that again? Because everyone's chasing material blessings. Everyone's chasing money. Everyone's chasing the next house. Everyone's chasing a new car. Everyone's chasing to dress their kids in the, in the finest and in the, and in the best and to give them whatever they want. And, and hopefully that, that, that is an appearance to men that they're, they're, they're going to be good people in life. Or hopefully that's an appearance to people that I'm a good father, I'm a good mother. Material possession speaks nothing to the condition of the heart. So we can't say, wow, what, what a car that man's driving around. He must have an integrity. We can't say that. But we can say he must have some money. He must have money, but we can't say he has integrity. We can't say he has, he has a good heart because we don't know the heart. Because... What, what is in the heart is revealed through morals. It's revealed through conduct. It's revealed through integrity, through the fruits of the Spirit. So, but, but because we live in a materialistic society where we think that if I don't buy this for little, little 10-year-old boy, I'm not being a good father, 
but yet you're teaching him the Bible. But yet you're you're teaching him how to pray. You're teaching him how to live by faith. That's going to take him further in life than with the next Nintendo. Amen. So I, I was amazed here. We, we have a room here with my wife, just three, three doors down. And we hire that out. And on, on Fridays, there's an Islamic group that hires it out for three hours. And I said to my wife, what are they, what are they doing there? I don't want them, you know, planning the next, you know. I'm just, just kidding. I'm just kidding. I said, what are they doing? She, you know what she said to me? And it left me gobsmacked. She said, it's not for adults, it's for children. They're teaching them how to pray. And I came on Friday because I had to come here to the church and I saw the little kids with their, with their dress appropriately and they're teaching them how to pray. Now that's a religion that not, does not have the truth. How many of us are teaching our children how to pray? Not how to play. No, no, no. I want, I, I, I want to give them the. I want to give them the best of life. Teach them to pray. Teach them to read the Bible. Teach them to respect authority. See, material possession speaks nothing to the condition of the heart, and everyone's chasing possessions. Even the church chasing possessions. And the, the, the material possessions of a church speaks nothing to the integrity and to the heart of a church. Amen. Because I've got a, I've got a, 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 we're, we're supporting a church in Pakistan. Yeah. I'm going to go preach in Philippines in, in October. And, and uh, you should see th- their shacks, their buildings, yeah. their ministry. But oh, they know how to pray. Yeah. Oh, they know how to lay hands on the sick so they recover. Or they know how to stand in faith when they come to try to persecute them. Like the brother in Pakistan two weeks ago, one of, his, one of the people in his church or in the community, the woman was raped in front of her, of the, her husband for being a Christian. And then the next week they're in church. In you. They've got a faith that is in them. But they're in a building that has no roof with bricks made out of mud that they make. Yeah. They've got something. But in the Western countries, we chase possessions. We chase material things yeah. because we think this, what the Apostle Paul said here, when he said, uh, he says, that, that they, you may have some way to answer them which glory in appearance, but not in the heart. The church in Australia, the church in Western countries, glories in appearance, but we're lacking a lot of heart. Come on, shout amen, church. We're lacking a lot of substance and faith. And we talk a lot. We post a lot. I'm just like, stop it. Stop with the post. Stop with the appearance. Stop it. we're, we're, We're... we're trying to glory, we're bringing glory to ourselves. Yeah. We need to have heart, yeah. substance. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul, he, I mean, this man, he, they, they say he was small, he was bald, but not my bald, okay? He was like a, it was, this is a cool bald, praise God. No. <laughs> there's a funny bald, you know, there's, there's, sorry, anyone that's bald, no. We're cool, brother, we're cool, we're cool. Yeah. They say he was small, he was bald, and he wasn't much to look at. Because what happened on the day that he fell off the bull, the donkey, whatever it was, the light that shone, the glory, it blinded him. And they say that he would walk the rest of his life with like scale, like a, he, had, he had some damage done to his face because of the light. So that, they say that he was, he, like, he couldn't open his eyes properly, he had a funny look. He was small. And then, then, then they say that he walked funny. He walked like this. Because, maybe, maybe more funny, more in like this. Like this. Because he would, his, his, his vehicle was a donkey. So he would, do you know the missionary trips he took? They were long, long journeys. And he had to have his legs like this the whole time. So they say he had a funny walk. And he, 
Ay, pa niya maapos. In appearance, there wasn't much glory. But when he opened his mouth, ay, ay, ay. Come on, us Latinos, we say, ay, 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 ay. When he opened his mouth, demons trembled. I can just see when he's going to Ephesus on his donkey, the demons are going, oh, oh, there he comes. Get ready. Sickness, disease, demons, get ready. There comes that little man, the little bored, funny looking man. He's coming to our town. Get ready. No, but today, oh, can I go there? Can I, can I go there, church, please? That today, we, we, the, 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 we, we look like the apostles walk in, like even with bodyguards. It's like, and they've got the walk and they're, they're untouchables. I think demons laugh. They don't tremble. They don't tremble. We glory in appearance. See that? So when, when there was a man... One son of a, of a priest called Skifa, he said, you know what, we're going to do this thing that, that Paul does. We're going to cast out demons. But they don't realize the level of spiritual battle they're getting themselves into. But they, they want the glory without the story. They want the platform without the process. They want the power without having gone in through anything. So they say, oh, we'll do what Paul does. So they come to a demon and says, man, we bind you, we cast you, we command you to leave. And this is how confident they were. In the name of Paul, uh, Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Well, that sounds real convincing. And the demon said, Jesus, we know him. <laughs> Paul, we know who he is. But who are you? Now that word no in the original, literally, it, it's got a, a, a meaning of a photographic image. So what they're saying is, we have a photographic image of Paul. We know who he is. So we've got him in our heads. We know who he is. We have a picture of him in our minds. But as a matter of fact, we talk about him a lot in hell. Jesus, we've got an image. Photographic, dangerous man. Cast us out easily. But you guys, I can't find you in my, I can't find you on my photo album. What's that called when you got the photos on the, on, the, on the phone? I said photo album. Man, that's a long time ago. Huh? Gallery or... Okay, hey guys, he's trying to cast us out. Who is he? Who is... Oh, we, we've got no photographic image that you've ever done this before. And that you've been prepared for this. So the demons came out, beat them up, took all their clothes off them, and they ran out of the city naked. Amen. Because they didn't have something in them. But we're chasing material things today. Now, nothing, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to, my, my time is going, but I'm going to get to that. There's not, there is a material generational legacy we have to leave. That's imp- I'm going to show you. But not at the expense yeah. of this spiritual legacy of what we teach our children. So, so I'm going to say this again. Material possession speaks nothing to the condition of the heart or to one's integrity. It does speak to the fact that one has money, but not necessarily one has morals, a healthy marriage or a strong family. Amen, church. I want my children to say who I am. I don't want to say, say oh, I was a great father. If I've got to say oh, I was an amazing father, I taught them the Bible. No, no. If I taught them the Bible, there's the letters. Read them. Yeah. Read the four of them. I could say, in my house, we live by faith. Okay? Check it out. If my children can't live by faith, in my house, there was no faith. Yeah. If I say, in my house, this is important to us. This is what's important to us in our house. We honour Jesus. We talk a certain way. We respect. We honour. We go to church. We tithe. Amen. That's important to us. Amen. We love the Bible. Mm, we love the Bible. Yeah. Okay. I don't have to say to you guys, man, you should have seen how I was as a father. I was strict. And the kids and the book you're reading is nothing like they're strict. Amen. Now, I... That doesn't mean that every now and then, you know, we're doing a podcast, you know, with my wife and we're talking about 
you know, that, you know there, there's always a black sheep. And I said, no. I said to us, well, we were saying that. No. Why do we have to accept that? Yeah. There shouldn't have to be a black sheep. Amen. Why can't they all come out? Well, why not? Yeah. Now, I understand there's uh, exterior pressure and there's friends that they get into. But you should be confident in the book you're writing amen. that they'll be able to discern when the enemy is trying to kill, steal, yeah. and destroy. Can you shout amen, church? Yeah. So I don't want us to be, you know, like trying to, out there we glory in appearance. We're the perfect family. Here, smile. <laughs> now we're going to go to someone's house. Behave. Please don't embarrass me. Now we say that because sometimes they do embarrass us. Eh? They say, you know what, and we're going to pray for the food. When I start praying for the food, you go in tongues, you go in tongues, you start praying. And let's just pretend that we do this all the time. Hallelujah. trying to appearance. Now, you might laugh, but I know families like that. 20, 30 years ago, I remember there was family like that. I thought, my. And it wasn't like that. I want to be confident in the deposits that I put into my children. Not just the deposits that I put into their bank account. See, legacy, let me say that again. That, that sounded good. Legacy is not what you deposit into your kid's bank account. It's what you deposit into their heart. Mm, write that down, praise God. Nothing wrong with depositing something into their bank account as long as you deposit something into their heart. Amen? Okay, last thing here. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. So you don't think what we witness today with my father and my mother-in-law, that doesn't deposit something in our hearts? That doesn't deposit something in their grandkids? Of course it does. Of course it does. Now, look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. And we'll finish with this. Because you're a smart congregation. You get it. I don't have to preach too long because you're smart. Sister Brenda thinks, say amen, praise God. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. Now, can I just say something to you, church? This verse that we're about to read is one of the most, it, it's this, one of the saddest verses in the Bible. It's one of the most, I, I think, spine-tingling verses in the Word of God because of its context. Okay, so let's read it. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Now, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, they knew not the Lord. Let me read that again. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Now another translation says they were son- Belial means wicked. So they were the sons of the wicked one. Another translation says that Belial literally means sons of Satan. Now here's the context. Eli was a priest and a prophet, mainly a priest, in the temple of God. He was a senior pastor of a church. He, listen to this, he was good at making disciples in church, but he was bad at making disciples at home. He was good at preaching from the platform, but he was bad at preaching at home. He had, a, he had what we would call a thriving ministry in the temple, but he was a failure in his own house. Something happened in Eli's ministry that there was no deposit into his children. Oh, please don't miss this church because he was so busy with the ministry. He was so busy. Now I'm just I'm putting it now in, in our times. He was because he had to do sacrifices in the morning, in the afternoon. He had to prepare the oil. He had to then accept the people from Israel, pray over them, and ask for forgiveness for them. They bring it, and it was just a very, very busy responsibility job that he had. But somewhere along the line, he neglected his two sons. And his two sons became sons of Belial, wicked, evil. 
one, if you read the chapter 1 and 2, or especially chapter 2, it tells us that these two sons would stand at the door of the, of the temple and they would eat the people's offerings and then they would pick out women so that they could sleep with. The sons of the pastor, of the, of the church there in, in Israel. Now, we, if we go a little bit further, it's, it says they were, they were the sons of the wicked one, okay? But then it says they knew not the Lord. Wow. How did they not know the Lord? How did these sons of a man who was the priest in the temple did not know the Lord? How did they turn out like that? How did they turn out wicked? How did they turn out? Now, I understand wicked because this, you know, some, some son or daughter can be in the best home, under the best teaching, under the best ministry, and still get caught up. You know, life throws things at you. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about, even, you know, I, 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 that's why I like to read biographies. I read biographies. I don't like reading science fiction and, 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 and story. I like biographies because it tells you about men and women of God that went through something. Yeah. And if you look at every man of God, something Many of them, something happened with their children. You look at, you read Billy Graham. What happened with what, some of his kids? Even Franklin Graham, who is now an evangelist, he had his years where he went off into the world and came back. So there's this, there, there, there is this wickedness that we, we might get involved in, in sin, and, and we might get involved in, in, in wrong, wrong friends and, and the wrong relationship and do wicked things. But, but to not know the Lord... See, I, I, I know people that, that they grew up in church, they, 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 they grew up in a home that, that honoured God and that loved God and, and prayed and read the Word, and then they went into the world, but they knew God. Amen. There was some sense of respect and some sense of knowledge about God and His Word. Amen. They knew God. What happened here that these kids didn't even know the Lord? I suggest to you that that Eli loved the ministry more than his family. I suggest to you he loved his job more than his home. He loved people, other people, more than his own people. Oh, he loved the members of the church more than the members of his home. If there's one thing that I've made very, very clear to my wife, and, and my wife to me, she tells me and I tell her, and, and we tell our kids, is that our number one church, and I mean this, our number one church, our church is our home, our family. That is our number one church. I, I love, if we, we have a Monday night, sometimes we'll do, we'll do a prayer night, read the Bible, I can enjoy myself more in that, even than what I'll probably do on a Sunday morning. Just hearing them read, hearing them pray, hearing them ask questions. That's our number one church. This is what we've been called to do. This is part of our vocation, our calling. This can be here today and we could go and plant another church tomorrow. Yeah. This is not legacy. Amen. This is not legacy. Amen. This is God's legacy. Amen. Oh, come on. This is God's legacy. See, and you are pastors and men and women of God. They, try, they, they say, I'm building a legacy. They, that what they're saying is I'm building a church. And in that building a legacy, we, we stop building the, the, the legacy, which are our children. Amen. Amen. This is God's legacy. Amen. You're God's legacy. I'm God's legacy. Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. When He went to the cross, the Bible says He looked through the cross and He saw you and He saw me and therefore He endured the cross. For his legacy, for his, for his children, for his body, hallelujah. As a pastor, all I do is love people, preach, and, and do what God calls me to do. But this is not my church. It's God's church. It's his legacy. That's why, that's why some people say, oh, pastor, he's very, they say, they say oh, he's cold. You know what I mean? He doesn't show. It's, it's God's church. At the beginning of my ministry, I used to get a bit ruffled and get upset when someone, I heard someone said something or I heard or someone left and I'll, and I'll think about it for one or two days. And I, and I, and, and what, I said, hang on a minute, why am I getting upset over something that's not mine? Yeah, right. It's God's. Amen. 
God's people. That's free. I'm free. Then I go and preach. I was in Adelaide last week, two weeks ago, preaching. I'm, I'm writing letters. I'm going to be next week in Sydney preaching and I'm, and I'm building people up. I'm discipling people through the Word of God. We, this is God's thing. This is God's. Amen. But what happens is men and women get so caught up in I'm building a legacy and neglecting our real legacy. So you, you have a business. I'm building my business. I've got, if I don't work, who's going to work? So I've got to go and work. I've got to, I've got to work. Sunrise to sundown. I'm, I'm building. A, I'm building this business. Um, and sometimes what happens is we love clients and we treat clients better than we treat our children. So we'll give clients a time to meet up with them, and then we haven't even spoken to little boy, little girl for the last three days. And I hope this is helping you, church, this morning. This, this is this is spiritual legacy. The, 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 the reason we have today what we have, families broken, it starts, and I'm sorry to be so hard, but it starts with the parents. Yeah. We don't need modern parents. Yeah. We need godly parents. Yeah. So Eli say, oh, look at my temple. Come to me. Look at my temple. Look at my ministry. Look at my disciples. This is my leadership, everyone. Yeah. Look at my Facebook, Facebook post. Of me preaching. And, and, and little, the little boys at home go, man, I wish dad would, you know, give us some time. I wish dad would take a photo with me. I wish mum would, you know, spend time with me. But we get so consumed with, because we think we have to appear. It's the glory of appearing. He says, someone of glory in appearance, but they've got nothing in. May God help us this morning, church. I, I don't want to be like Eli. What a failure that I preach the gospel to the world and, and the kids and your children don't even know God. Wow. That's a failure. Can you shout amen, church? You know, I was thinking about this, this past week. Just begin to play softly. We, we, we are over our time, but listen to this. This past week, the 23rd of April, my father passed away three years ago. It's his third year anniversary of his death. Died suddenly, 68 years old. He pastored a church for 40 years between Brisbane, Chile, and then back to Brisbane. Pretty much pioneered, to a certain extent, the Spanish movement, in, in, in at least in Queensland. You know, when someone passes away, you don't forget. Especially when the anniversary comes around, you're thinking and you're thinking. And I got to thinking about him. And I started to think about the deposits that he he put into my life. And I thought, what's his legacy? What's his legacy? Is his legacy the car that I drive, the business that I have? Is his legacy a building? And the Lord said, in my spirit, that's not his legacy. His legacy is who you are. What he's deposited in you. Into his, chil- into his children. And it lives on. Legacy lives on. Someone said to me once, I never met your father, but I can sort of get an idea how he was and how he preached and his convictions by seeing you and hearing you. There's a church, can I say something to you? Love your children. Invest in them. Yes, yeah, sorry. There was that last that last just just bear with me church. Proverbs 13:22 says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Are we to leave a monetary inheritance? Yes, as much as we can. But if we can't, make sure we leave a spiritual inheritance, a spiritual legacy. So yes, we work to provide. We work to supply. And I would love to leave an inheritance to my children's children. In other words, their kids leave them an inheritance. 
Why not? That'd be good. That's part of it. But not at the expense of neglecting the deposits in, in them. So we have a big responsibility, church, to deposit something into our kids. So, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What you have, I saw it in your dad. And what your dad had, I saw it in his dad. It's generational. Nothing is lost in teaching our children our children something spiritual and of faith. Let's all stand up this morning, church.